Welcome to the In Her Financial Shoes podcast with me, Catherine Morgan, the podcast that helps you step into wealth. Deserve it, create it, grow it. Money, profit specifically, is not an event, it's a habit. Profit is an accumulation of small little wins that happen every day, every hour, not that just magically fall into your lap. So we need to put the habit in place today. Like, this isn't the life that I want to live. Like, this is not the path that I want to take. I want to be the master of my ship. I want to control my own destiny. Who were you before you were their partner, their mother, their colleague, their father? I'm passionate about helping you to feel confident, to transform your relationship with money and take that next step. The question is, are you ready to be that wealthy woman? And remember, it's not about the money. Small steps, big wins, let's go. Hey guys, and welcome to this week's live episode of the In Her Financial Shoes podcast. How are you all? I hope you're all doing incredibly well, hopefully avoiding COVID this week, and looking forward to the Christmas period that's coming up very, very shortly. Um, so, and I hope you like my new video too. Like we've only been using this once or twice. So for those of you that are listening live right now on our social media channels, um, we had this video put together as a little introduction from some of our fabulous guests that we've had on the podcast over this year. And today I've got an incredible guest with me today. And I'm just going to just click on to my other part of my screen. Just bear with me one second. Uh, there we go. And I'm going to bring on to the podcast today. Um, sorry, my screen's just gone really weird. Here we go. Um, so today we are interviewing the incredible Dr. Robin Norris. And now Dr. Robin Norris and I met in a psychology um, sort of mastermind group that we are in, both involved in um, last year, actually, I think it was. And um, I've invited Dr. Norris here today. Um, she is a, a marriage and family psychotherapist, and she is the owner of a organization based in the US right now called Wenwood Optimal Health. And we're going to be talking about some of the challenges that we face when we're talking about money in relationships, in couples, in our family relationships. And this is a really interesting subject for me because I'll be sharing today actually a little bit about some of the challenges that my husband and I have had around our relationship with money. Because statistically, did you know we're actually attracted to somebody who has the complete opposite relationship to money with us? There's a lot of research around this, which maybe we'll get into today. And what that can do is it can create some challenges in how we show up and how we talk about and communicate or not <laughs> around money. So I really want to talk with Dr. Norris today about, well, why does this happen and what can we do about it? And this is a great time of the year, I think, to be learning how to harbor better conversations in the household, because it's typically over Christmas that we have a bit more time. We're spending maybe a bit of money over Christmas presents, and there may be a clash of values in, you know, what are we going to buy for our parents this year or our family. So I think it's a great conversation to be having. So I'm just going to bring Dr. Norris now into the interview. So welcome, Dr. Norris. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you so much for having me. I appreciate it. Oh, you're so, so welcome. You're so welcome. Now, um, just a little bit of background, um, Dr. Norris, for those people who haven't come across your work before, could you perhaps just give us a little bit of an introduction as to who you are and what you specialize in? Sure. I am a traditionally trained psychotherapist um, from the United States, and I specialize in working with couples and families to talk more about their um, differences in opinions on finances. So Amazing. My original, my original training was in trauma, and so I've um, worked a lot with um, harder things like loss and grief. Yeah, do you know, it's one of the things that I really enjoyed about reading some information on your website was that uh, the work around trauma, I think, is such a valid conversation. Like we don't, we just don't really talk about the impacts and the influence that trauma has on our relationship with money. Mm -hmm. And actually could, oh, sorry, my tech is not going well for me. So I'm just trying to cancel a call. <laughs> not 
Now my mic is just muted. Oh, my tech is not working this week. Um, what I was just saying there was, um, even though we're not talking about trauma today, could we just very briefly touch upon um, why is it so important that we consider trauma in the context of money? I think the biggest thing around trauma with money is um, hopes and dreams that may have not been fulfilled by uh, generations before us. And so if I don't want to purchase something, it may be because I came from a family that didn't have enough money um, to purchase things like the basic needs. So food, shelter, clothing. And now you're asking me to purchase something that I wouldn't consider a basic need. Um, and so it, it can pile up for the generations and we may not even realize it that we may want to have bigger emergency funds um, for those just in cases because we saw relatives, friends or family go through experiences that we know now can happen. They may not happen and hopefully they won't happen to us. But if they did occur, we had best to have some more finances in our in our bank accounts that is totally different than if we have a partner who um, has not had that type of trauma in their background because they misunderstand they say well we see you know the money there and um, why can't we spend it we should spend it we should live for today not for tomorrow <laughs> and so trauma can can lead us into doing different things um, ensuring ourselves differently and when you say trauma, would you be able to share a couple of examples of what do you mean by trauma specifically? Sure. Um, trauma, I use in a broad definition of anything that somebody did not feel settled with and not, um, how do I put it, not um, completely okay with. And so my definition of what might be traumatic might be someone else's definition of might, what might be dramatic. Um, when we think of a larger trauma, we think of fire, we think of earthquakes, we think of, you know, loss of an immediate parent while children are still little, like the, the big, the big traumas, the big T's. But then there's all those other ones where we could have been bullied at school and nobody knew and it was um, subtle and it occurred for a month. But that's the kind of thing that sets our self-esteem up as we go along. So it really gets defined by the person, though there are some larger ones like like um, global pandemics <laughs> yes. um, to consider as as traumatic. And, and what impact does that have? What impact does trauma have then in how we communicate in relationships around money? Mm, great question. We go straight to our primary um, ability to fight, flight, flee, you know, go inward. Um, what do we do with that trauma? How do we defend ourselves? Um, our primal brain kicks in and says, oh, I need to stay here and be quiet. Or, oh, I need to run. Um, that can look like a bank account not being disclosed to a spouse. That's my version of a quiet. Or I need to run. So therefore, I've taken 10,000 out and I've put it in a sack and I've put it in the glove compartment and started driving. So, you know, that's where the, the primary instinct of safety can actually play out in, in numbers. And how does that lack of safety show up in how we communicate or miscommunicate or not communicate with money? I think that's a part of it is not talking to the person or getting mad at the person or crying and not you know, feeling heard or understood. Mm. And so it becomes that dialogue of what's the real dialogue below what's being said. And, and sometimes that, the individual themselves doesn't even know how to express it. And that's super interesting, isn't it? Because when we're not heard or understood, then we're least likely to express anything because right. then we feel like, well, whatever we say, that the other person's not going to listen anyway. Right. How, how do we get over that? So if someone's listening to this and thinking, yep, that's exactly the challenge I have in my relationship, that when I do mm -hmm. communicate, I'm not heard. How, how mm -hmm. can that person within the realm of what they can control, mm -hmm. what, what can they do about that? 
oh, they can seek counsel themselves, but they can also write it out. They can also talk to friends. They can talk to ministers, whoever a, a guiding person and a, a good listening ear might be. Um, because sometimes things come back up to us as adults that we don't even realize that were from our childhood. So if mm -hmm. something occurred to us when we were six and now our children are six, all of a sudden it's bringing us back to that primary school. And we didn't know that going into our marriage that we would feel this way about being a parent <laughs> of a six-year-old. So there's sometimes those hidden things that come back up that, you know, your your spouse is like, well, you've never said this before. And you're like, I've never felt this before. Mm. Um, and then they just kind of pass it off. Like, you should just move on. Don't worry about it. And you're just like, it's eating, it's eating at you. So finding somebody to talk to, going for walks, taking deep breaths, exhaling, <laughs> um, and writing it and getting it out. You really do have to almost play the trauma sequences out. Otherwise, they just keep sticking. Yeah, I'm so glad you've mentioned that because, uh, and I've only really recently become um, a, a kind of practitioner in some of the somatic work where, you know, we can really get it out of the body. So I yeah. trained earlier this year in EFT and matrix re-imprinting, yeah. which is kind of getting that trauma out and away from the body. Yeah. And it's in, it's something that we don't necessarily even think about, but when we often, when we talk about money, we get the feelings, don't we, of anxiety or like this mm -hmm. pain in my chest or in our stomach, like our second right. brain. And then we hold it in the body and it's always mm -hmm. there. And then that affects our well-being and our physical health. Yeah. Could you just share with us, um, Dr. Norris, because I know this is going to be an area that you're highly qualified in to talk about here, is that what impact does that have? If we don't release that trauma, we don't release those emotions away from the body, what are some of the kind of symptoms or, or sure. Are so sure. Fun. So, I mean, we might be off putting to others. So we're already, you know, messing up our attachments to others if we're grumpy and we don't feel good and we don't want to talk and we just don't don't have a good affect. We're not going to attract, you know, goodness to ourselves. But even more importantly, like John, Dr. Don Sarno had always talked about and um, also Dr. Vessel van der Kolk, which is that body keeping score means that we're going to start a cascade of medical events that we don't want to have occurring. So, you know, if our heart beating is at a different rate than we need it to be and our blood pressure is at a different rate and we've got shoulder pain and hip pain and back pain and we can't carry things the way we need to, we are now actually readjusting ourselves in a way that's not healthy. You know, so our stress of our money might stick in our shoulder <laughs> and then we might compensate by using a different arm to carry our groceries, which now throws our whole gate off, which might make us trip. And so it's a cumulative effect. Um, I liken it to the to the movie or the show Jumanji in that, you know, when we've buried that box, all of a sudden it's going to come thumping up later. And the way through that that movie was to play it through. Um, it wasn't fun. It was ugly. It was scary. It was icky. But that was the only way to be rescued. And mm -hmm. so um, so headaches, stomach aches, like you said, all of those different areas. Um, a lot of orthopedists, I'm sure, see things that they need to scope that they're not sure what this is from because mm -hmm. it's not necessarily a break or a tear, but they know that it's bothering their patients. Yeah. And, and so often that happens, doesn't it? When we've got this pain in our stomach or in our chest and we've had all the blood tests and everything that we can possibly have to try and find a, a diagnosis. And actually mm -hmm. the answer is we don't know. And and, and I think mm -hmm. a lot of it is just stored trauma. And and the book that you mentioned there, I'm going to ask you at the end, actually, what your, some book recommendations for our mm -hmm. listeners. But the, it, the Body Keeps the Score is a really interesting mm -hmm. book around this kind of topic. So if this is something that is of interest to you, then please go and check that one out, guys. Um, so in, in context of better conversations at home, maybe mm -hmm. this time of the year in particular, how important is it to understand each other's needs and how important is it to understand our own needs and in mm -hmm. which order should we maybe do those things? I think we need to understand our needs first, because otherwise our needs can get quite muddled up with other people's needs. Yeah. And then once we understand our needs, we kind of have to set the scene as to how we're going to discuss those with our partners. Mm 
Mm. And what I mean by that is actually pulled from um, addictions theory, which talks about the halt. You know, AA has the hungry, angry, lonely, tired. I tell couples, please don't try to do this right as you're getting into bed, as one person thinks they're going to go to sleep and the other person's brain is ready to talk. You know, you have to set the scene, you know, do we have to have some food between us? Should we have a cup of tea? Should we, you know, make sure that we've got some fresh air? Because what happens is we try these conversations on the fly and they don't work. And then one person feels very unheard and then the other person feels very mad Mm. (laughs) and it just kind of keeps building. So setting the scene with our with our partners is primary to the beginning of the conversation. And um, I'm just thinking of this with my husband at home. So we tend to, so we'd see, we have this kind of, we didn't used to be like this, by the way, but we have a, a quite a regular money day, but we always do it on a Sunday morning mm-hmm. because that's the time when the kids are all normally on their technology and we've just made a cup of tea and there's kind of no stresses going on. There's no distractions going on. And I think sometimes that that question of when would be a good and useful time for you to have that conversation is useful, yeah. but also maybe that could be a useful question to ask of each other. You know, I'd like to talk about money. When would be a good time for us to do this? Yeah, yeah, because um, some people might be morning people. Some people might be evening people. Um, That's one that I find that, like you said earlier, you know, we tend to um, attract our opposites. So maybe we need to meet at lunch then. (laughs) You know, if one person wants to talk at 6 a.m. and the other person wants to talk at 6 p.m., that's not optimum for either. So maybe we cut it somewhere at 11 or one. <laughs> yeah, that's a great suggestion. Always maybe, you know, a glass of wine or a cup of tea is always a good advice, I think, to have in our hands as, we, <laughs> as we're right, talking absolutely. about money. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, the other thing that I think doesn't get enough um, discussion is when we talk about it, how do we learn? So like when you were in elementary school, what way did you learn best? Did you learn by doing? Did you learn by watching? Did you learn by listening or writing? We don't ask that of our partners enough. That is so true. It's 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 almost like that. One of the things that we taught, teach in our financial coach training program is about mm-hmm. this all sensory participation. Money is an all sensory participation. Mm-hmm. But as you say, we've got different learning styles. So if we're visual... This is quite interesting for me at home because my husband is, um, every time we talk about money, he wants to get the spreadsheets out. And I'm like, put the spreadsheets away. Like looking at numbers for me because I'm very right brain dominant just doesn't work. Whereas for my husband, um, I have to get whatever I want him to do or hear in the first three words of my sentence. Otherwise, he's already zoned out. Right. And he's a visual person. Yeah, very an auditory much. person. <laughs> <laughs> very, very much so. Right. And that's interesting then, isn't it? So that's a good a good question to ask of each other is yeah, how do you best learn? How do you best communicate? How would how would someone know what that is? Well, I think you figured it out just now with your with your partner and the fact that he comes at you with his way of teaching about his way of learning. He yeah. comes at you with the spreadsheets. He's got all of these pictures <laughs> and you're coming at him with, no, 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 I've got story. I've got words. I've got text. <laughs> and he's going, all right, she done in three. <laughs> and so it, it's important to just ask that basic question of when you're in school, you know, because it's asked of the children all the time. We're trying to sort this out. You know, mm. how can we get them to learn? Do they need to be the person that walks while they listen? You know, because that's going to be a very different feeling than sitting on the couch at home if one person has to gently walk on the treadmill in the same room. They're actually hearing more and they're not ignoring you, but they are ignoring you when they feel uncomfortable sitting on the settee. They're just like, hmm, this doesn't feel right. <laughs> yeah, there's, I've read some research before, actually. If I can find it, I'll pop it in the show notes. But it talked about how this like walking and talking concept mm-hmm. is really conducive for much more open conversations and particularly for men men like to walk and talk right it gives them something to do in general men tend to be doers they want to be fixers yes (laughs) and so that's where I find that a lot of women say well he's not listening and I'm like well he is but he's waiting for the item that says he needs to action on it 
And the woman's like, I just need him to hear me. <laughs> and he's like, yeah. well, which part? <laughs> what do you need me to fix? And she's like, no, you just need to listen. That's actually fixing for me. Mm, and yeah. that can get quite confusing in couples. <laughs> There's a hilarious video on YouTube, and I think it's called something like the nail, the nail in the head. Um, mm. Have you have you seen it? No, Where it, no, it sounds. Oh, nice. I'll have to send it to you. It's so much fun. It's literally a couple sitting on a couch, and there's this lady with a na a physical nail in her head, and this guy is like she's talking to her partner, and she's like, I don't know what's wrong with me. Like I've got this pain, and this guy's like looking at her as if to say, Well, of course you have, darling. You've got this massive, gigantic nail in your head. And she's just talking and she's just like, I just listen. I just want you to listen to what I'm saying. And then right at the end of it, he's, you know, he's like, you've kind of got this nail in your head. Like, cause he wants to right. go straight to the solution. Right. It's that kind of hunter gatherer mentality, isn't it? I think so. I do. Yeah. So how important is it that if, if we know that, how important is it that men make the decisions around money? Do you think? I think if you're in a mutual couplehood, it should be both people making decisions about money, or at least both people should be deciding who's making what decisions, yeah. <laughs> if that makes sense. Because some men want to default their their um, budgeting to their wives, and some wives want to default it to their husbands. But I think that it needs to be a coming together to make that decision of how are we going to do this? You know, are we going to have one bank account? Are we going to have one bank account and two separate spending accounts? You know, um, I the one thing that I don't think couples do well enough, especially in 30s, 40s and 50s, is to discuss, you know, what are the breadcrumb paths if one of us wasn't to be here? Mm. And that's not a conversation we like to have. It's an icky one. It feels awful. But I find too often a spouse will become widowed and nobody knows how to get into the laptop. Nobody knows really how to get into those passwords. Not Things are not all on paper anymore. And so, you know, you knew the account existed, but where, how, what? Is it Bitcoin? Is it Ethereum? I mean, you know, so having those discussions um, or at least having the plan is very, very crucial to prevent future trauma from happening yeah that's a great and 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 for us so we weren't particularly good at this in our household even though we're both in financial services right we were never great at organization mm -hmm. and last year we we actually created a template for our community and then we started we actually tested it using it ourselves at home first mm -hmm. and so we have everything on a trello board now um, but we also created this like editable PDF that people can use and kind of print off because I know not everyone likes to keep it online. Some people are quite, you know, kind of mindful of passwords and things like that. But mm -hmm. it is a great time of the year, I think, to take stock of, OK, so where are our insurance policies? Where's our will stored? Is our will up to date? Mm -hmm. You know, where is our budget plan or our spending plan? Where is, um, you know, and maybe up just just a general overhaul and update yeah. on financial paperwork, I think is a really yeah. good time of the year to kind of have a really good declutter and kind of get as best organized as possible. So that, as you say, you just never know mm -hmm. touch if something was to ever happen, even if you were in a, you know, you bumped your car and you broke your leg and you're in hospital for a week and right. you need another person to be able to just take over the finances for a week. It's just yeah. no way you can get to everything passwords etc so i think that's a really good a really good tip yeah um, just going back um dr norris to what you said about understanding our needs and the importance of understanding our individual needs first mm -hmm. people really struggle with this like what are my needs like am i even allowed to have desires like right. just the word is like oh god well i don't deserve desires because i'm so busy looking after everybody else right and, and that kind of fawning mentality of, you know, trying to just please everybody else. Mm -hmm. What would you say to anyone who struggles with understanding what their needs are? How, how mm -hmm. can they do that for themselves? I think they just need to slow down and say, if I was a kid and I was being asked what my needs were, what might they look like? Kind of go back to your inner child. You know, do I need sun? Do I need shade? Do I need a warm blanket or a hug? <laughs> um, I think if we give ourselves, and I say to people, don't don't mull over it too long, but set a five minute timer and really sit with yourself and say, 
you know, how do, you know, we'd start with the body scan, you know, how do I feel? Do I feel settled? Do I feel unsettled? Because I think we can get closer to the core of who we are and what our needs are. Mm -hmm. And then that can help us transcend to what are our hopes and dreams and wishes. And, you know, you know, if, if somebody says to you, well, what would you like for the holiday? Well, I don't know. I'm the person that gets everything for everybody else. What do you mean? I, I don't know. I mean, am I even somebody that's a tangible goods person? <laughs> or yeah. would I rather just somebody do the dishes for me that night? <laughs> so I think it is about setting the timer for five minutes and saying, all right, I can do five minutes of mm -hmm. thinking about me and that that's an okay thing. Mm. And there's a little quiz, isn't there, that they can do to help them to understand their needs what well, could you do that we can do the love languages quiz online and um it's really brilliant because again it's something that i would encourage you to do yourself and then you can always have your partner do it um they even have ones for your children now as well because we don't recognize you know do i need time do i need a gift do i need something physical like a hug um or do i need somebody to action like I said, you know, please vacuum the rug for me today. <laughs> um, it kind of gets at more of the heart of who we are. And I think that's important in finances because if year after year you were hoping for a massage gift certificate and yet again, you got another bathrobe, <laughs> you're going to kind of feel guilty that you're saying, oh, gee whiz, thank you. But it's not really setting the heart of you on fire. <laughs> And so that kind of communication around the love languages is critical to know yourself and then know your partner. Yeah, I, I think I've spoken about this before on the podcast. So when myself and my husband did this a few years ago, his uh, two highest love languages were words of affirmation mm -hmm. and physical touch. Mm -hmm. And so always joke about it that when Gareth's the chef in the house so when he's cooked mm. a really nice meal I'll literally just go up to him stroke his arm the physical touch mm. and then just go oh that was such a wonderful meal thank you right. and you could just see his sense of oh amazing like she's really like she's showing that love yeah. whereas Gareth did that to me words of affirmation don't they're not on my highest love language right Whereas um, mine is more about, actually, funnily enough, my second one is gifts. I like receiving gifts. Sure. So um, my top one is around um, like time. So mm -hmm. someone gives me time or they do something that shows they've spent time thinking about creating it or something. That means a right. lot to me. And that's yeah. how I feel loved. So it's really interesting that when you can better understand that and, and do this with your kids as well, it's really interesting it definitely does harbor for better conversations because then you can, you'll know, you know, maybe if physical gifts is your top love language, then actually mm -hmm. the need to buy things for the, ourselves or each other might be something you need to put into your spending planner that you need right. to create a certain amount of money per month to allow us to meet that need. Yes. Um, yes. So it's a great little quiz. What, yeah. was, your, what was your top, um, result can you remember <laughs> oh, um physical touch and words of affirmation oh amazing so, yeah great. and I love it but the holidays are a struggle when people say well, what do you want and I'm like I just want you to sit here <laughs> <That's what laughs> I'm I'm like, no we can't buy that for you and I'm like oh. so you know this year I told my daughter some artwork <laughs> because oh. you know it was just kind of like the kids want to do something, make something, give me, th they don't want to just sit. <laughs> you know? my husband, I think he feels better if he can go to a store or get something that he feels like I need that I might not have even known I needed. <laughs> it's almost like the, the gift, the gift of presence, not presence. Yes, exactly. <laughs> exactly. I love that. I love yeah. that. Um, are there any final tips or shares that you wanted our listeners to hear today, Dr. Norris, about how can they harbor better conversations at home around money? I think it's just to remember to be kind and compassionate to your partner when they're getting angry, <laughs> because sometimes there really is a safety thing that they just haven't been able to express that's below why they're saving or why they're spending. You know, it could be that they're fearful they won't be here tomorrow and they did want to see joy on your face. 
and you just didn't know that. And so I think that we just kind of have to give grace and kindness <laughs> to each other, especially in those moments where we just don't feel well with them. <laughs> mm. And so if, if that person listening to the podcast is curious to have a conversation and their partner just doesn't want to talk about it, is just kind of burying their head in the sand or just doesn't maybe get angry talking about it. How would, how would that person best deal with that situation? Do you think? I think it really would be to, like I said, dig deep and try to figure out, are there other ancillary conversations that are safer to have to try to move that other person towards having that conversation? I think the conversations need to be had. So if somebody again, fight, flight, if they're running away from a conversation by getting mad, just recognize why are they feeling insecure? Why are they feeling unsafe? Why are they feeling unsure? And getting them the help they need because a lot of people can look like they're the walking well, but they're really harboring a lot of stuff that they're just stuck in. Mm, that's really curious, isn't it? Mm -hmm. And how, so I guess in, the, in that situation to have a third party involved in that conversation can be useful if that mm -hmm. person shuts down or doesn't want to talk about it yeah how would you approach that with your partner if you think that actually having a third party whether that's a, a financial coach or a therapist mm -hmm. how would you approach that without like I, I guess putting the hat on of men like to make the decisions here as well mm -hmm. like how would you approach that conversation perhaps I think interestingly enough they like to be helpers and so if you can approach it as I need to do this for us and this would help me, then sometimes it can deflect a little bit of that you need to change <laughs> or mm -hmm. you need to think differently or act differently. But if you can talk with your partner about the idea that I'm not feeling so good and I need this for me, can you do this with me? Sometimes the conversation looks different and the movement towards a third party um, can actually occur. I love that. And that's a very collaborative language too, isn't it? Mm -hmm. That we, we, you know, could, can, can you help me to resolve this for us? You know, yeah. or it, it's very collaborative language, isn't it? Absolutely. It's a much more peaceful way because otherwise you're going to have that defensive wall go up even bigger. <laughs> yeah. Which we don't want this time of the year for sure. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> enough worries. <laughs> yeah amazing oh well just some real golden nuggets in there and i really hope that if you're listening to this um you know have a think about whether collaborative language might be useful for you whether it's more about understanding your needs to make sure your needs are met as well as your needs in your relationship check out that love languages profile quiz it's a really it's completely free just go to lovelanguages.com and we'll pop a link in the show notes to that um and and maybe perhaps just view money from a a different lens that money, you know, it's never about the money, is it? it right. It's often about the meaning of the perception that we attach to money. And therefore, if we can better understand that, that will yeah. open up that opportunity for us to harbor better conversations around money. Absolutely. It's about the hopes and dreams and fears. Yeah. Amazing. And what a great time of the year to explore, you know, our hopes and desires yeah. for 2022. Like, absolutely. What do we want for next year ahead together? Um, Absolutely. And and I know you've mentioned a, a book already um, in today's interview, Dr. Norris, but are there any other books that you would recommend um, for our readers to, uh, our listeners, sorry, to, to read? <laughs> um, <laughs> sure. Well, like I said, it was The Body Keeps Score. Um, I also like the work of Dr. John Sarno, if you're into the somatic space, because he talks about, you know, how the body keeps score as well in a different, in a slightly different way. But um, I don't, uh, he's got a couple of books out, um, not popping to mind in terms of the title though. So it's Dr. John Sarno. How do you spell the Sarno? S-A-R-N-O. Sarno, okay, amazing. I'll, I'll have a look at the title. He has one on back pain, but essentially he talks about our emotional pain can be what's creating the physical pain. Mm. Well, so I'm really curious to put that on my book list because you know, money is emotional and practical, isn't it? And yes. it's not always about the practical side of money that we need to have the conversations around. It's sometimes right. less about the budgets and more about 
how are we actually feeling about talking about money? Absolutely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep. Amazing. I love that. Thank you so much. And for anyone who would like to connect with you, Dr. Norris, where would be the best place for them to come find you? Oh, sure. It'd be my uh, my website, which is wind-opt.com. And um, again, the company is just Windward Optimal Health. And I'm always ready to have a chat. Amazing. I'll pop a link to the show notes in there. And maybe we'll see you again one day, Dr. Norris. I know that you hey. used to live over here and, and you participate in some pretty like athletic sailboat racing, I, I hear as well. <laughs> I, I did for a little bit when I was over there and I loved it. I loved it so much. So I uh, miss the Isle of Wight, miss those um, races around near cows and it was great. Did you ever visit the Channel Islands by any chance? A little bit, yeah. Yeah. And then we also, we did, um, we had another race the, um, to Wiesterham. That was a fun one. So we did all sorts of neat things. <laughs> Beautiful. We've just recently moved to Jersey in the Channel Islands. So there's lots of um, water sports and boats and all sorts around the island. It's lovely to see. <laughs> yeah. I, I love that whole community of just water. <laughs> Yeah, it definitely creates an energy of like spaciousness and freedom. Mm -hmm. and, yeah, it's, yeah. It's, it's beautiful. Yeah. Amazing. Getting back to nature. <laughs> exactly. Although not so much on days like it is today where it's absolutely throwing it down, but <laughs> we can hope for better weather. Yeah. Oh, thank you so much for your time, Dr. Norris. And thank you uh, for joining us across the waves with your expertise today. I really hope this episode will help a lot of people listening over the Christmas or New Year periods uh, around having better conversations with money. And as always, we'd love to hear your thoughts on this episode. If there's any little golden nuggets, maybe let us know what your love languages profiles were. Just drop me a DM over at Instagram on uh, Catherine Morgan Money. And we'll see you all again very soon. Take care. Mm -hmm.